agreeing to this discussion. Uh, the next topic is what, what physics we are missing, uh, in particular in this supermassive uh, black hole binary simulations. Okay. And uh, take it away. Thank Thanks. you, Zoltan. And in fact, I'll try to include references to the stellar case as well as the supermassive black hole case, because there are actually you know, real parallels between them. Now, as Zoltan said, my charge is in fact to raise all those can, open up all those cans of worms, raise all those skeletons in the closet and so on to provoke discussion about those issues of physics that in fact we have not considered or considered inadequately and may have the possibility of overturning the apple cart or shining a bright spotlight of insight into the physics so that we actually learn something new and can make progress. Um, now, technically, they said the title is Missing Physics, but there's only little scraps of things I'm going to say today that have never previously been mentioned anywhere. And so what I would regard as a more accurate definition is the underappreciated physics, the neglected stepchildren of physics that you know, someone's mentioned in a paper somewhere, but may actually be more important than the way it's been treated. This conversation was begun yesterday in Andre Pecha's session. He dealt with a number of topics, and I'm going to be dividing up my part into various subheads, which includes, in addition to these four that the you know, committee um, decided to assign to me a little bit of overflow from yesterday's discussion. So I'll be flipping back and forth between presentations here. And after each of these sections, I hope to have provoked people or stimulated people so that you will speak up, ask questions, make comments, criticisms, etc. to have a genuine discussion. To the extent that there are other ideas about missing physics or questions left open after today's session, there will be a third missing physics discussion tomorrow led by Roger Blanford in which all unanswered questions will be discussed. Okay, so with that, let me flip for a moment to the other presentation. This is the overflow from the yesterday part. And what I need to do is okay. okay, at this point, we have a brief um, trip backwards in time to about uh, 1240 yesterday afternoon, the very tag end of the radiation, et cetera, discussion of missing physics. And what I'd like to tell you about is something that I'm really just representing because the real author and creator of the tool I'm going to describe to you um, is Brooks Kinch, who unfortunately is not here to talk about it himself, but he is really the person who um, invented this, I think is a truly remarkably powerful and interesting tool. So the question at issue is, so we have these accreting systems, and for this purpose, it really doesn't matter a great deal whether it's a single accreting object or a pair of them. The basic physics remains the same. That's, I think, particularly the case for the black hole version of this. And I'll say it's been, so it's been developed for the single black hole case, but can be easily extended to binaries that we're more interested in here. So the question is, we have all these wonderful simulations that do dynamics. They tell us about velocities and changes of, of gas density and pressure and so on. But you know, nearly everything we know about astrophysics comes in photons. So the question is, how can we link those dynamical data to the photons that we actually observe? And as that list of questions shows, actually questions, sorry, steps shows, this is a complicated business. But the key points are first, that what the dynamical simulations yield are a series of 3D snapshots of the mass density, the internal energy density, 
the velocity and magnetic field. And critically, you also need some measure of the local dissipative heating rate. Because of course, where those photons get their energy from is the heating. I'll remark that in the latest version of this tool, and uh, you can see by the references, it's gone through the stage of several stages of development over the past five or six years. Um, the latest version actually does a physical cooling rate in the corona of the disk. And you get corona when you have magnetized disks um, without even trying, particularly if, if they are around black holes. And that physical cooling rate is a pretty good zeroth order estimate of the actual constant cooling using the seed photons, the thermal radiation coming out of the body of the disk at that time um, in, the, in the simulation. Okay, so what needs to be done here is to combine all these radiation mechanisms. It's the constant scattering, I'm not scattering photons coming off the continuum photosphere of the disk. That's going to produce hard X-rays. Then it's going to be the um, reprocessing of the X-rays from the corona that strike the surface of the disk and are either absorbed or reflected. The energy that's deposited from the absorbed uh, um, high-energy photons needs to be um, restructured which in a way that you find through a 1D transfer solution at each area element in the, um, in the photosphere of that disk body, the column of gas down below, which has been ionized and heated by those X-rays. So that means in order to <clears throat> excuse me, find the opacities and emissivities, you also need to solve a local photoionization problem and a local thermal balance problem. All of that requires um, circling around many times and iterating to convergence, happily with some clever choices about how to structure things. These iterative cycles are short. Often three or four iterations brings you to excellent convergence. And the result in the end is a completely self-consistent description and you know, energy conserving, et cetera, of the spectrum radiated by the system at each snapshot in your data. It is somewhat computing intensive, but not nearly as expensive as the simulation that generated the underlying data in the first place. And in fact, it's quick enough that it's possible to do the parameter survey. I'm going to show you a few examples of results. The underlying simulations are general relativistic MHD using Scott Noble's ARM 3D code. This is the sort of vanilla single black hole accretion problem. Ordinary poloidal magnetic field, nothing special, no extra magnetic flux or anything like that. And what you get out is, let's see, is there a pointer here? Um, do we have some kind of laser pointer? Uh, a stick. Okay. Okay, this sticks long enough that even someone as short as me can reach. <laughs> okay, so for example, you can measure the temperature distribution of the coronal luminosity. That is to say, how much power comes from regions with what electron temperature. You probably can't see the scale. This is 10 keV here. Uh, this is 10 MeV up here. The color coding is in this legend up here, three different spin cases, eight spin parameters 0, 0.5 and 0.9. <clears throat> These legends are the accretion rate in Eddington units, 0 0.01 here, 0 0.1 there. That's for those as well. And so what you can see is that in fact, first of all, there's a considerable spread of temperatures in the corona. Not surprisingly, <clears throat> the corona is coolest where it's near the continuum photosphere. And then it gets hotter as you move away from it. The gas density drops, the density of seed photons to cool on also um, drops. 
but the heating rate is still strong because of all the magnetic events of at high altitude. So it's a very broad temperature distribution characteristically. Another interesting analytic result is that so we, it does all this phonoionization, which means it can compute the iron K alpha emissivity from first principles using the simulation data. Every previous analysis of iron K alpha profiles has assumed some sort of phenomenological power law with a knife edge cutoff at the ISCO. The radial scale here is the <coughs> Kerr-Chilled Kerr radial coordinate in units of the ISCO radius, because we have different spins. One is there, there, again, color-coded by spin and you know, different accretion rates. And what you can see is that the peak in the emissivity in these cases generally takes place a bit outside the ISCO. You know, more or less factor of one and a half, factor of two, illustrating that in fact, you know, the ISCO is definitely a significant location, but it is not a hard and fast border that you know, in which things actually change drastically. As material moves in through the disk, it, its radial motion gradually accelerates. Then it passes smoothly through the ISCO and the radial motion accelerates some more, so it thins out the surface density. And when you throw all that together with the illumination pattern of the X-rays and the um, ability of the matter to hold on to um, electrons in those iron ions, you get a more interesting distribution and that cutoff is not particularly tied exactly to the ISCO. That of course introduces significant systematic effects in inferences of black hole spin from fits to the position of that cutoff. Over here are the solid angle integrated continuum emission. I should say also that um, this is computed not just from a single snapshot, but by averaging a number of snapshots at different times in the simulation. For this column again, m dot of 0.01, this 0.1, the spins from 0 to 5, 0 0.9. And what you and the units here are nu L nu. So that's uh, luminosity per log frequency interval. For the lower accretion rate, the spectra are generally fairly hard, <clears throat> which corresponds to, in crude terms, the typical situation in um, black hole X-ray binaries. At higher accretion rate, m.1, they're steeper. Again, corresponding to the phenomenology that's actually seen. These particular cases, I'll emphasize, are all for black hole mass and tensile masses. It's a little bit simpler physically because there are fewer elements that hold on to any electrons, so the phonoionization calculation is simpler. But the same method applies to the supermassive black holes, where the temperature is lower, there are more um, elements with ions of significant abundance. Um, Brooks has done a test case to show the method works pretty well. And you know, that's for future. So that's all the report on, on this. And are there questions, reactions, et cetera? Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is really exciting, Julian. Uh, I'm, I'm super, um, uh, super excited about the ability to connect simulations to observations in this self-consistent way like you described. And I'm wondering, um, this gives you a possibility of connecting a simulation with the same thickness of the disk to different luminosities as far as I understand, right? So uh, I guess I'm trying to understand um, the top left panel says M dot is equal to 0 0.01. Mm -hmm. I presume that means it's 1% Eddington? Yes. And uh, the second panel from the left in the top row is uh, M dot equals to 0 0.1, mm -hmm. which is 10% Eddington. So how have you been able to simulate a 1% Eddington disk? It will be super, super thin, like H over R 0 0.01. Oh, oh, um, okay. The way this is done is a little bit schematic. The thickness here was not as thin as, as you suggested, but where the 
scale of the accretion rate actually enters is in the definition of the photosphere. Definition of what, sorry? The definition of the photosphere. Gotcha. As you know, that if you're dealing only with gas in dynamical quantities, these simulations in general are essentially scale-free with respect to the gas density and also the, in fact, the black hole mass as well. But if you have radiation quantities, you know, those are you know, centimeter square per gram numbers, and that ends up specifying the accretion rate in Eddington units. So the n dot, little n dot basically defines the location of the photosphere in the, sim in the simulation. So you, it rescales the density, therefore it rescales the opacity, it rescales the scale of the photosphere, but uh, uh, would the results you expect be sensitive to the geometrical thickness of the disk? Because that will change, right? Um, and if the disk is thinner, it mm -hmm. means that it will be closer to Keplerian. If it's thicker, it will be further away from Keplerian, especially around the ESCO. Um, so that's what I was curious about. Ah, okay. I think the principal effect is not so much in the thickness per se, provided that H over R is always smaller than one. You know, things get different when it's really puffy and round, but provided it's fairly thin, it's not going to be a great big difference. The real issue here is the division of dissipation between the region inside and outside the photosphere. That's really what counts. And just for the quick follow-up, what was the H over R in this simulation? Is, just, is it 0.05 or something like this? Oh, um, to tell the truth, I don't recall. I believe no it was around that, but I would want to check. Gotcha. Thank you so much. Great job. And as explained by that, that refers, that choice of the thickness in this case, refers only to the disk body where the thermodynamics are handled by um, a cooling function that keeps, that takes the, back, the gas back to the initial specific entropy. Um, but in the corona, it's this physical cooling. So that we don't put in. That's whatever comes out of the calculation. Got you, thanks. There's a, another question on Zoom. Um, yeah, yeah, me. Um, so uh, excellent work, not, not my field. I'm, I'm curious about the um, uh, approximation that the dynamics is 3D, but the radiative transfer is 1D. So it's been known since at least uh, Johansson, Uden, and Clark 2009 that MHD tends to produce uh, uh, zonal flows, which are you know can introduce a significant amount of radial structure, uh, which obviously might affect the uh, the radiation hydrodynamics uh, as well. So I'm wondering if that that's an effect that's been considered. Oh. We are concerned about that effect. Um, but I think for the, in most regions, the 1D approximation is pretty good because we're really looking at the disk atmosphere. So for the radiation transfer, what you want is basically the shortest direction out to the surface. And that's in most places pretty close to vertical. Where the disk is not so optically thick, so it's really the full body that's contained, then the ability of the photons to wander radially as well as vertically is going to be greater. And the, the local 1D approximation isn't as good, but through much of the disk, it should be all right. And uh, you probably also know 3D transfer is a whole lot more complicated. So you know, for the future. Of, of course, but I'm just curious, do, do the underlying MHD simulations mm -hmm. show significant radial structure of, of zonal flows? Not on the scale of, of these sort of atmosphere things. And I should also backtrack and say that in the corona, the transfer is full Monte Carlo. So that has no symmetry restrictions at all. One more question in the back. Yeah, thanks, Julian. This is really encouraging. Uh, my question was very simple on what's the typical ratio of uh, magnetic pressure to gas pressure ratio in these uh, GRMHD models? Oh, it varies all over the place. <laughs> um, this is 
first of all, a turbulent situation because the magneto-rotational instability drives MEG turbulence. And second, the relative buoyancy of magnetic field relative to matter means that generically in everyone's global MHD calculations, the plasma beta, the you know, ratio of gas pressure to magnetic pressure is greatest near the midplane and declines sharply as you go away from the midplane and out into the corona. So that ratio might be 100 in the midplane and it might be 0.1 in the corona. And, and these are non-radiative models, right? Pardon? These are non-radiative GRMHT models? No. Um, in the disk body, um, as I said in answer to Sasha, the, there's a cooling rate that's designed to restore the gas to its initial entropy on the time scale of <clears throat> the local orbital time. In the corona, the cooling is Compton cooling on what you can estimate because you know the dissipation rate is the thermal emission coming off the surface of the disk. So that's a physical rate. Thanks. Okay, uh, uh, do you have a question, Kathleen? Yeah, it's on a, on a slightly different topic. So if there's a follow on, I should wait. Uh, okay, then maybe Elena? Uh, yeah, so I want to see No, it's good. Let's uh, actually, yeah. I think we're, on, we're almost halfway. Oh, yeah, through. and I, I'd really like to get back to the other, the main topics of anything physics for this. <laughs> um, uh, Either one. Uh, so, yeah, yeah, I wanted just to say, like, going back to binaries. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, what do you think? So, uh, okay, this is an exciting work and, and so on. Uh, so, uh, going back to binaries, what would you use this? Uh, uh, what, what is your favorite favorite questions that this uh, radiative transfer method mm -hmm. could uh, answer or address? How we would use it uh, oh, okay. in binaries? For stellar binaries, it may be less appropriate because although you still expect you know, a corona because it's magnetized, the intensity of the X-rays will be lower and the temperatures in general are much lower. So there's a different set of radiation mechanisms and a particular opacities and emissivities in the disk surface. So this is, as currently constituted, it is a tool that's best suited for the black hole case to look at, so let's say, protostellar disks. You'd want to reformulate it in terms of really the molecular physics and dust and so on that comprises the material in a stellar disk. And so it's a, it's a different set of calculations that are relevant. Oh, yeah. Yes, exactly. So oh, that, the, that, was, uh, yeah. that was actually yeah. my question. Oh, for my the question. binary? Yes. yes. Uh, that the is only question. significant change to put it into a binary black hole case is that when you look at the Compton cooling in the corona and can imagine you're at some location and you're looking all around the photosphere to ask what is the surface brightness as a function of location on the photosphere. And, and because by definition you're outside the photosphere, travel is optically thin, so you can just project it geometrically. Then the geometry is different. You have to look different places. But that's really the only thing you need to change. So on the stellar side, there is a lot of post-processing of known systems. Mm -hmm. And so would you say that this is then is what is required on the supermassive or the black hole side to get to a similar parallel of post-processing comparison to observations? Well, to tell the truth, um, my lack of knowledge of state of the art on the stellar side makes it difficult for me to say what's on a comparable level. <laughs> Um, I think this do is the right set of mechanisms, radiation mechanisms for the black hole case. As I said to Elena a minute ago, you need a different repertory in the stellar case. 
Okay, so Caitlin, do you want to change the topic again? Sure, I'll just I'll say for, for the black hole people, there are codes, and Stefan can talk about this more, I'm sure, like RADMC3D, which is a radiative post-processing code that is heavily used in the protostellar and star formation community to do this kind of thing. So there's definitely, but that takes into account right. molecular cooling and dust opacities yeah. and things like right. that. So doing different set of calculations. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But so my, my actual question is sort of trying to link up a little bit this mm -hmm. in the last discussion um, related to something I know very little about, which is GR. Um, so forgive my ignorance here. I'm just wondering if there's an interesting regime from the uh, either the stellar mass black holes or the supermassive black holes where a post-Newtonian approximation is interesting in terms of maybe the dominant thing you care about is an extra precession term. Mm -hmm. And the reason I think this is relevant, or it seems relevant to me from the last discussion, is the question of eccentricity pumping in either the binary or the disk. And if there's these regimes mm -hmm. where you have a stationary or a processing bump, that's something where precession rates obviously change when you include general relativistic precession. But I haven't heard that specific thing brought okay. up. So I just, but I don't know, maybe it's irrelevant for these okay. mass ratios and um, separations. So Maybe we should, I'll just jump to that and answer because I think the literature on this is almost 100%. Uh, let's see, Scott's here, Mark Avara is here, um, Manuela Campanelli is listening in. Um, our group has almost a monopoly in the market here. If we've been studying the post-Newtonian regime, that is to say when the binary separation is a few tens of gravitational radii, and that's important because it's the prologue to Murter, and it does begin to display relativistic effects. It's a complicated space-time to construct because it's two black holes, not one single. You know, we know how to write down Kerr quickly. Um, a binary, particularly one that's also inspiraling, so it's changing, is more complicated. And I'll just quickly say that our current method of choice for it is a superposition of a pair of Kerr shield space times, one on each of the black holes. And <laughs> we found that if you do that right, the level of error in space time measured by constraint violations is pleasingly small and about on the same level as a rather more complex high order post Newtonian um, expansion that we've been using previously. I wanted to actually see, since there are others here, yeah. to see if they have something to add to this, Scott, or, or maybe Ma Manuela, I see you're on Zoom. How, hi, how you... can you hear me? Yeah, hi, yeah, we can hear you. <laughs> okay, since you call my name, I'm responding. I think That's Julian said it very well. Um, I think that what we do uh, for the construction of the space time, um, you know, uh, there is no space time in post Newtonian T, so you have to build it. And there are various prescriptions that you can use. Um, uh, the way we, we do it uh, most recently is how Julian described it by uh, superimposing two care shield black holes. Um, and that approximation, you know, is going to break down close to merger, but we can monitor the um, deviations or the violation of the constraints. Um, and so we know when that is going to break down. But what we want is that we inject into that space time post Newtonian theory by giving the black holes the right trajectories. So they are going to move according to the theory post theory up to, we have up to 3.5 order. We have generic orbits, spins, eccentric orbits, processing spins, all of that is being implemented. Is that responding to your question? Uh, no, no, I'm asking a much, much stupider question. I, I wanna just know what happens to these binaries and disks if you by hand put in like an extra omega dot. Oh. Like, does that matter for the okay. evolution? Not, not the details of how you do it. I'm sure that's very complicated. I'm very impressed. I'm, but my question was very simple, sorry. Tell you what. I I'm sure Julian and, and uh, Mark tomorrow, I think, what is he speaking, Thursday, is going to talk about that. But Julian, maybe you what can- What I was going to do yeah, let, let, is let, let me let, use that as a springboard to something else of interest. Actually, let me, yes. before, uh -huh. we do have a couple of other questions and I do want to yeah, keep track of the time. We have about 10 minutes. So we'll have to go to this question and then 
Maybe yeah. Um, cherry pick one more topic. So Magdalena Shivik. Hi. Um, I wanted to ask something about your um, overview slide. So if you can go mm. back to this quickly. Mm -hmm. um, you're talking about including um, GR and then 3D, but also warps. By warps, do you mean uh, general relativistic warps as in the Lenz Turing effect? You're talking about pure um, hydro effects, like having an uh, inclined disk that then realigns with the binary. And then if so, what, what do you hope to learn from that? What, what do you think is going to change for the binary evolution if, uh, if, the, if you have a disk that realigns with the binary plane? Okay, well, the answer first is all of the above. Um, and this is an interesting territory because as I said at the beginning, there has been a little bit of exploration of it. Uh, there's a small literature, I think the papers I've listed are the principal ones exploring it in the context of binaries. There's a much, much larger literature uh, exploring this in the context of uh, single masses. And it has the potential to do interesting things because we really have no way of knowing how the mass being fed to the system is aligned with the binary orbit. You know, depending on what those boundary conditions are, you know, it may or may not have be more or less parallel anchor menta or totally independent. So if you imagine there's a circumbinary flow, and it's, if it happens to be oblique to the angular momentum of the binary, then the quadrupolar moment of the binary exerts a precessional torque on that obliquely orbiting stuff outside. It gets to, it's significant on a scale that's sort of several times the binary separation because the quadrupolar moment depends on that. And that precession may, we don't really know it thoroughly, there's been not that much work on it, begin to align the inner portions, especially of the circumbinary disk, which means that, of course, over time, the angular momentum brought in with the accretion flow begins to reorient the binary orbit. But in addition, then, you know, there are more things that can take place within those inner disks. On the stellar scale, it's again a response to the quadrupole moment of the binary. When there's a black hole, there's the additional potential effect of lens tearing precession from the black hole spin, if that too is misaligned with everything else. In that latter case, there can be a competition within the, these mini disks between the precession and perhaps forced alignment due to the spin and the precession and attempted forced alignment due to the quadrupole. So there's interesting stuff to explore here. All of this has the potential to alter the path of accretion because there are now all these out of plane effects, possibly introduce new um, modulation effects, we don't know. Um, it may also introduce new observables because there are various opportunities for streams to shock and so on. This is also an area where, which, you know, unlike some of the other topics, the underlying physics itself is not very well understood. I would argue that there is actually a good deal of rethinking that's necessary to the theory of alignment due to these processional torques itself, because so much of it has depended on assuming that there's a significant regulatory power due to, quote, isotropic alpha viscosity. You know, the alpha model in time varying sharp gradient regions is a weak read to begin with. When you talk about the accretion stress, when you talk about out of plane stresses, then you really wonder about whether it's relevant. And in fact, nine years ago, John Hawley and uh, Kareem Sarathia and I demonstrated that it really doesn't exist at all. There is no MHD correspondence to isotropic alpha viscosity. 
So, so I, I don't, I don't want to go into this sorry, because there are long, there's lots of controversy and it's yeah. not directly related to binaries. Just to say that there are things that need to be worked out and thought through. Yeah, I want to make sure we give a few more minutes, last few minutes to anybody else who thought about these warps or have questions about it. Uh, Mark, did you? The microphone's migrated across the room, so we'll get you on. Can, can, I, can, I, can I just quickly yeah. answer Caitlin's question about um, procession? Um, so we, we do have, uh, so we do know that uh, tidal disruption event debris disks are affected by apsidal procession. Um, and so we do have that um, in our, you know, in our calculations automatically because they're relativistic, but um, we have not measured any sort of um, observable phenomena. And actually our results look very similar to she et, al's, she et al's results that were done with Newtonian gravity. Um, so um, to be continued and explored. Um, yeah, I just wanted to, to maybe add in, in comparing to the, to the 2D picture and simulations of 2D systems, you go, you know, of course you have to go to 3D if you, if you want to consider warps, but at least in my view, the first step is, is to better understand um, to better understand exactly what is happening with the transfer of angular momentum between the inner edge of the circumbinary disk and the black holes. Because of course in, in 3D for warped single disks, you have a certain way of, you know, lens throwing procession kind of maybe smoothly transporting angular momentum. And then the extreme is if it's, uh, if it smoothly causes, you know, too much of a bend, then you can get a break. But in the, in the binary case, so much of the angular momentum transport happens across the very inner region and if you misalign the circumbinary disk, uh, the material that gets flung out and is carrying a lot of that angular momentum that's out of the plane can get redistributed in a radial way that's completely different than the uh, um, uh, than the uh, uh, the single black hole case. So, yeah. so all right, this is maybe just or a, a specific piece yeah. of of what Julian was. Or just the aligned to. case that we're accustomed to thinking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and just a second comment. So there was a recent paper from our group. Um, uh, 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 Lopez Armengol uh, 21 that, that showed for different spin effects at even the relatively close separation of 20M separation for the binary. So, you know, very close compared to what mostly we're talking about in the conference. Spin effects didn't seem to change the disk dynamics too much. And so I, th I think at wider separation, uh, a lot of the post Newtonian effects probably die off. Yeah, yeah. The, the principles, um, the, I have my second is the principal spin effect is that when it's prograde, it shifts the ISCO inward. That's significant because on this scale, binary separations of a few tens of gravitational radii, the tidal truncation radii of the mini disks is not that much bigger than the ISCO if the, spin, if the black holes aren't spinning. And when the outer radius of the disk is only you know, a factor of two bigger than the inner radius, doesn't take much angular momentum loss to move material inward because the dissipative processes are associated with the stress that transports angular momentum. That also means it's less dissipation. So there are interesting ways that the radiative properties of the disks change when they're relatively narrow annuli. And if the ISCO moves inward, then it's more of a conventional disk. Thanks very much. I think we did reach lunchtime. So uh, I encourage everybody over lunch to discuss warps and uh, general relativity. <laughs> yes. And uh, we'll and have some more time. In Sapita, we get, uh, didn't get to discuss tomorrow. all the other things. <laughs> <laughs>